G'day everyone. I hope you're doing well. Hope you've grabbed your cuppa. Uh, you're ready to settle in for about 20 or 30 minutes or so. Um, and we're going to have a chat about stressed out sharks and what this means for their survival, their reproduction um, when they're caught in commercial fisheries across Australia. So if you just bear with me one moment, I'll just bring up the, uh, hold on, where are we? I'll just bring up my shared screen. All righty. So I hope everyone's doing well considering the crazy times we're in. Um, but for the next 30 minutes or so, let's learn a little bit about sharks and forget all the madness that's going on. All righty. So as I said, stressed out sharks. And we'll look at how the fishing affects their biology uh, of our fishy friends. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty of it, um, we'll just give, I'll give a brief overview as to what I'm going to be talking about and what we'll explore. So I'll give a really quick overview about their general biology um, and the threats they face around the world and their, their risk of extinction. Um, we'll then dive into a bit more of an Australian context and, and what it means for sharks here in Australia and how we fish. Um, we'll then start talking about stress and why stress is important when we're trying to understand the impact fishing has. And on top of that, it's also going to be really um, important to know what, general what a general capture scenario looks like and believe it or not, um, even what it feels like. And when we get into that, I'm sure you've had quite a few experiences where you might actually have felt similar to what a shark's felt when it's been caught. Um, and as I said, when we look at stress, we'll then, I suppose, look at the, the real crux of it. And that is, does stress kill sharks when they're caught in fisheries? Um, and if not, what, what are the implications? What happens? Um, and finally, just to let everyone know that, you know, over the decades, we've, we've, we've developed solutions through research and we've got them on the table. Some of them have been implemented and some of them are yet to be implemented across our fisheries. So there is a way forward and we'll touch on, on how we can do that. And then following all my preamble, if I haven't bored you to death, um, I'll answer as many questions as I can. So feel free to write them in the comments. Um, I might not be able to get to all the uh, questions, but, uh, Give me a bit of time, maybe a couple of days, and I'll endeavour to get to as many of them as I can via Facebook afterwards. So strap yourselves in. Let's go for it. So sharks in general. They're more like us mammals uh, than other fish, believe it or not. And that is because they're long-lived, they're slow to mature, and they give birth to relatively few offspring. So by long-lived, um, you know, sharks can take anywhere from as as little as maybe eight to 10 years to mature. Um, and in some species like a dusky shark, they've got to wait until they're about 18 before they're ready to reproduce. Um, in terms of how long they can live, uh, just this year we found out that whale sharks can live until they're at least 50. I mean, that's incredible. Um, so it's no reason to think that they might start nudging towards 100. Um, and at the complete other end of the spectrum, the world record holder is the Greenland shark that lives for 400 years. I still can't get my head around that. So while you had Vikings marauding through Europe, um, you know, an adult Greenland shark is, is just being born. It's, it's baffling. Um, and as I said, few offspring. So you've, you've got gummy sharks, which are small bodied species in Southern Australia that can give birth to maybe 20 to 30 um, each year. Now that might sound like a lot, but you've got to remember fish in general, lay eggs, they spawn. You can look at hundreds of offspring. Um, and then you've got other species like the grey nurse shark that might only give birth to one offspring a year. So they really are slow to live and they give birth to relatively few young. Of all, of all sharks and rays, 60% of species uh, give birth to live young, the rest lay eggs. Um, and because they are vertebrates, and I know that might sound like I'm stating the obvious, but it's important um, because evolutionarily speaking, vertebrates tend to have a very similar response to stress um, and to some degree, even the way their hormones work. Um, so for example, when we look at estrogen and testosterone and progesterone, um, these behave in a very similar way across vertebrates in terms of maintaining pregnancy and even laying eggs and getting ready for reproduction. And when it comes to stress, uh, more specifically, the stress response in vertebrates is generally conserved. So it's, it's very similar across animals, but there are some differences, uh, particularly one minor difference with the shark that we'll, we'll touch on in a little bit. If we look at the extinction risks sharks face around the world, it's all about fishing. It's all about F. 
So F is the letter that scientists and fishery managers use to measure total fishing mortality. And that means basically, um, essentially how many sharks die because of fishing. Um, now, like what we mentioned earlier, being that they were slow to mature, give birth relatively a few young, they're basically being fished faster than they can replace themselves. And as a result of this around the world, 31% of sharks and rays are threatened with extinction. Uh, and if you, you know, if you have a look at that IUCN red list uh, bar at the bottom, you'll notice that um, second to reef corals, it's the highest form of marine, it's the highest uh, ranking in marine life. And uh, sorry, it's only second behind reef corals in terms of marine life threatened with extinction. Um, and you know, this is more than if we look at mammals, so tigers, bears, and lions. Um, so they are in a pretty tough spot, um, but there are actions we can take to improve this and it really is urgent that we do so now. Uh, sorry, just one second. So if we look at the Australian context and, and what's happening here, um, Australia actually does have some hotspots of extinction risk. Um, what you will want to take home from this graph, and this is from a study that was published uh, in 2018, and what you want to take home from this graph is that we have a lot of speed shark and ray species, 322 in fact, um, which is a quarter of the world's shark and ray species. And of the species that we have here in Australian waters, half of them aren't found anywhere else. It's what we refer to as endemic species, uh, or in this case, unique species as well. Um, so that's one thing you want to take away from these graphs. Uh, the other thing you also want to take away from this map um, is the fact that one particular hotspot, so one of these triple threatened hotspots, so one hotspot is actually located on the east coast of Australia, and that is northern New South Wales heading into southern Queensland. Um, and it's that particular region there that scientists have identified where not only a wide a variety of species at risk of extinction, but also ones that aren't found anywhere else in the world. Um, now, if we think of shark evolution as a tree with branches, um, you know, the main trunk being the source of all sharks and rays and all the branches being different kinds of species, if we're not careful and we don't act, um, we could chop off several branches of shark and ray evolution forever in these particular hotspots on the East Coast. So, and when, again, when we look at it in terms of the world, as much as Australia is in a relatively good spot with how we deal with our fisheries, um, we still need to work a lot in our backyard because there's a lot of risk and a lot at stake. So with sharks and rays in Australia, um, they're typically caught accidentally. And this is because sharks, I mean, sharks typically aren't worth very much and they take up a lot of room in a boat. Uh, there's also fishing laws that say you can only catch X amount of a certain shark or some sharks rays, you can't catch it all because they're protected. Um, but in saying that some are kept um, and this is what we refer to as byproduct and some are thrown back and this is what we refer to as bycatch. Should also mention that there are certain species that are targeted as well. Um, and these might be some of your black tips, uh, your bronze whalers or your gummy sharks. And culturally in Australia, since the 1920s, we've referred to shark meat generally as flake. Um, and we find these in our fish and chip shops. The, the fishing methods that we typically use, um, three main forms, and that is long lines, gill nets and trawls, which I'll touch on in the next few slides. So if we look at long lines, it's as the name suggests, um, very long lines, sometimes kilometres in length, um, with hundreds or even thousands of hooks hanging from them that are baited. Um, and as you can see on the bottom left here, you typically get your larger bodied species that get caught on long lines and your larger individuals. So you've got a bronze whale down there on the far left, um, and on the right of screen, you've got the iconic tiger shark, which is little Timmy up here. Don't worry, mate, you're safe. Um, if we look at uh, gill nets, as the name suggests, they're nets that ensnare fish um, at their gills and, and stop them from moving any further. So there's a picture of a gummy shark down there on the left. Um, that's one I took in the lab with an experiment I was doing. Um, but also gill nets are infamous for the sheer variety of wildlife they catch. Um, and it's a particularly tragic story when we, looked at, when we look at an endangered uh, scale tamahead, critically endangered in fact now. Um, and that's because of the shape of their head. So these two photos here were sourced from the Great Barrier Reef, believe it or not. Um, and with scalloped hammerheads, because of the shape of their head, smaller sharks, smaller hammerheads can't swim through the holes in the net and the bigger sharks can't bounce off it. So because of the shape of their head, they just get tangled really easy. Um, and unfortunately, more often than not die. And as you can see, nets as a method can catch sharks in quite large volumes. 
when we look at trawls, um, similar to a, a gill net in the sense that it's a net that's dragged along the bottom and it scoops up what it needs to catch and is quite indiscriminate. Um, and this can occur through all levels of the water column. Um, on the, generally speaking, in terms of sharks and rays, you're looking at your bottom dwelling species. So these are animals like your rays, your skates, um, and even some of the flat bodied sharks. So on the right down there, you've got an angel shark that's been caught. On the left, what you've got there is a few years back, I remember hearing about it in the news actually, I got really, really intrigued by it. Um, and that was a rare, a rare find of a basking shark. So these are huge sharks that feed on plankton. So microscopic animals in the water, um, very much the same diet as whale sharks. Um, and this animal here was accidentally caught in a trawl. So, you know, it, it, big or small, um, they're vulnerable. So the next, the next thing we want to know is, okay, we know how we fish. We know that we are catching sharks and some are dying and some are getting thrown back alive. But we really want to accurately assess what impact we're having when we fish. And this is where measuring how stressed sharks get is important. So it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward when we look at how many sharks die when they come to the boat. Um, but what we don't really know very well is what it's like for sharks that are released alive. Um, and even more so after that, to really bolster the accuracy of our predictions and what impact we're having, we even need to know what happens to sharks that survive indefinitely. So let's say they're released alive and let's say they don't die a week later, but in fact, live for X amount of years, you know, what happens to them? How has the stress affected them? And once we understand this broader picture, um, we can better understand the impact we're having. And as I said, getting to, this, uh, getting to the, the specifics of this is really understanding how sharks and rays respond to stress and enables us to best predict how we can fish for the future and, and the impacts we're having, as I said. So what does capture look and feel like? There's generally, typically there's three sort of phases. The first phase is the shark array gets caught. It struggles and it becomes exhausted. So sharks are mostly white muscle. Now this is the same muscle you and I have that we use when we go sprinting or we're exerting strength, basically any form of, of short bursts of power. Um, so sharks are predominantly this and they'll thrash around and they'll fight, you know, the fight or flight response. And throughout this process, um, you know, adrenaline's released. The shark basically wants to escape and then the process becomes exhausted. Once the shark's then brought up onto the boat, it then experiences air exposure. It's out of the water. Um, and also handling. So fishers will then have to get the hook out of the mouth, disentangle the shark from a net, um, safely remove it. Uh, and then in the last phase, um, release it if it's alive. But again, does it recover? That's another important question. So if you want to know how this feels like, I, back in the day, played a fair bit of AFL, Aussie Rules footy. Um, and I know what it's like to exert myself, and I dare say many of you out there do as well, when you exert yourself for quite a few hours, and you know, the next day, you're stiff, you're sluggish, you can't move. It's very much the same for sharks. So all you have to do is sprint 200 metres, but not just once, do it hours on end. Um, and then see how you feel, even in the space of a minute. Uh, and then see how you feel the next day. This is what sharks and rays are experiencing when they're caught. Um, so, okay, so we know that, but how, how exactly how do we physically measure the stress? So think of scientists in terms of measuring shark, shark stress as sports scientists. So we'll typically take blood samples or muscle samples, and then we'll analyze them for levels of lactic acid, lactate in the blood, um, electrolytes and salts like potassium, uh, glucose, um, and even white blood cell counts. So with all this, we get a picture of the physiological or biological response to stress, and we can sort of assess what condition the shark's in. Um, I touched on it earlier, but there's one thing that sharks don't have that a lot of vertebrates do. And that is sharks don't have the stress hormone cortisol. So in a lot of other vertebrates, they, scientists typically measure cortisol as a measure of stress. Um, this can be measured in blood, it can be measured in hair follicles, it can be measured in, in droppings. Um, but with sharks, they don't have it. Um, we can't yet accurately identify and measure the shark stress hormone. Um, so we use all these other measures to paint as, as complete a picture as we can. So an important thing to realize is that not all species are built equally. So as much as we can get a sense of the shark stress response physiologically, it's gonna vary across different species. 
And the easiest grouping to start with is breathing. Do they have to move or don't they have to move to breathe? And this is reflective of how much activity they require or how, sorry, their activity levels. So on one end of the spectrum, we've got sharks that don't have to move. The sharks and rays don't have to move. And they'll breathe by pumping water through their mouths, which is called buccal respiration, or through spiracles, which is kind of like holes at the back of their eyes. And that's spiracular respiration. And this allows them to breathe without having to move. They can pump water through manually, so to speak. Um, then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got your more active sharks, sharks that have to move to breathe. And this allows them to swim and open their mouth and force water through their gills the faster they move so they can get more oxygen. And this is called ram ventilating um, for the very reason that they're quite literally ramming through the water to get oxygen through their gills. So again, looking at the poor Jackson shark, um, it's quite a tough species. It's very tough, it's quite impressive. Now, it can actually, and I have to put the caveat here, this was done under strict laboratory conditions with the appropriate uh, ethics approvals and animal welfare in mind. But the poor Jackson shark can actually survive a couple of hours outside of water. Um, and it survives quite well afterwards. Um, now, don't do this when you go fishing. If you catch one, I highly recommend you snip the line instead. Um, but under laboratory conditions, it can survive air exposure and with no adverse effects as such. Um, on the other hand, sorry, the poor Jackson doesn't have to move to breathe and quite happily sit there and just move its mouth to pump water through. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got scalloped hammerhead sharks who are notorious for being super sensitive. Uh, the joke is they just see a hook and die. And the reason we say this is because when hammerhead sharks are caught on a line or a hook, um, and I've seen this when I was doing my research, is that for, for a hammerhead shark to live longer than an hour on a hook, um, it's not that common. Um, mo most of them are gonna be found dead, unfortunately, or tragically, I should say. But, and, e and even for those that are released alive, they're generally not in a good way. Um, so again, you've got these species where they don't have to move versus active species that have to move. And this is important because the type of fishing has an influence on how much stress the animal experiences. So basically, how restrained the animal is. You've got long lines, as we mentioned earlier, which you could call the lesser of the evils in this respect. And that is because they afford sharks and rays at least a bit of movement to, to, to move around. Gillnets and trawls, on the other hand, effectively stop a shark or ray dead in its tracks. Um, and in that situation there, it's the species that are gonna be able to breathe without having to move, the more resilient species, that are probably gonna have a better chance of survival than species that have to move to breathe. Another really important thing to, to consider when we fish is water temperature. So in the warmer months leading into summer and coming out of summer, sharks are more active. And the reason for this is because the body temperature of sharks generally reflects, the, with the exception of a handful of species, the body temperature of, the temperature of sharks reflects the water temperature around them. Um, now, the thing is with warmer water, yes, sharks become more active. Um, their bodily processes increase in, in activity. But the catch is, is that there's less dissolved oxygen in water at higher temperatures. So when we factor that in, plus the fact that sharks are restrained and might not be able to breathe, and on top of that are even more active, sensitivity typically increases in warmer, in, in warmer seasons. And again, it's gonna vary on the species. It also brings into the question, you know, what happens with climate changes if our oceans are warming? Now, we don't know an awful lot just yet with regards to the stress response and climate change in this context, but I'd be, I'd, I'd suspect they won't be as resilient and death might become uh, more likely given that activity is going to increase um, with warmer temperatures and there's going to be less dissolved oxygen in the water. So looking more specifically at the processes in terms of measuring our impact on sharks through fishing and stress. Uh, let's have a look at death and dying. So there's immediate uh, mortality, and that's what we call at vessel. So literally, is the shark dead on the boat? Um, and this can happen for a variety of reasons. The shark can experience an injury, so it can get wrapped around the main line. It can get wrapped in the net and be bruised. Um, it can also become bait for other sharks. And as you can see in this picture down the bottom left that I took, this was on a long line vessel I was on at the Great Australia Bite. And the gummy sharks become a meal. Um, hard to tell what species it is that, that's eaten it, but you know it's it's taken a decent bite out of it. 
Um, another thing that sharks will also experience is just handling an injury on the boat. So some fishers might use a gaff, which is a big hook attached to a pole to help kind of put hook the shark and then drag it up over the, over the gunwale of the boat or, or the edge of the boat. Um, and if that's not done properly and if it's done through the gills, it can actually cause mass bleeding um, and the shark's probably not going to survive that. Another instance of death is delayed or post-release mortality. So this is after the shark's been released. And this is where the stress response really comes into its game. Um, and that is with what we understand about how sharks respond to stress, or what their stress response is, I should say, can we predict what happens to them afterwards? Are they going to live? Are they going to die? Now, this, this is admittedly a lot harder to predict, but we do have some insights. Um, and that is sharks' muscles become fried, almost literally. So a general response is elevated levels of lactate in the blood or lactic acid in the muscles. And generally the higher this goes, um, the more likely uh, mortality is going to occur. And it obviously impacts the way the shark can move. This goes back to how you feel stiff after a lot of exercise for a couple of days or even immediately after. Um, another thing is potassium levels. So potassium levels in the blood, um, the higher they are, the greater chance there is of death or mortality. And what happens is, is potassium, when it's in the blood, it's an indication that the muscles are finding it harder to contract. They're becoming stiffer, or they might not even contract at all. Um, which I started asking the question to myself, you know, does this relate to perhaps having a heart attack because of all the exhaustion and the stress? I know, for example, when my father went to hospital uh, last year with a bit of a dodgy heartbeat, one of the first things I looked at in his blood samples uh, um, was potassium because ultimately the heart is a muscle. It needs to contract and without it, animals die. So it's an interesting avenue worth exploring. Um, another thing I specifically studied was um, specific organs and how they responded to stress, like an animal being stressed. So I found that um, the liver in gummy sharks is really, really sensitive to stress um, to the point where I hypothesized, I had this idea that, you know, having a look at some studies of hospital studies of people who went through organ transplants or who, people who had, you know, organs that were failing, if the liver fails, it can cause multiple organ failure. Now, it's an interesting hypothesis, it might happen, but the point is, is that through all this research that we're doing, we're getting a better understanding of how sharks respond to stress. And again, this overall picture that, that helps us improve our, our accuracy and our predictions and, and then informs how we fish so that sharks aren't as stressed. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, handling an injury on the boat can also influence um, the likelihood of survival. I'll show you this really cool video I took of a gummy shark when I was doing my studies. And this just goes to show how exhausted sharks get and how it influences their movement. So as you can see here, this shark's been on the ground. It's been released, but it's been absolutely cooked. It's exhausted. Now, it's important to realise this because um, gummy sharks, you know, might only get to about you know 1.8 meters. They're small for a shark, but if you're a shark that's swimming like this, you are going to be easy pickings for a bigger shark that's hungry. So again, we might release them alive, but do they survive? Let's have a look at the last part: sublethal effects. So by sublethal, it means effects that don't kill them. Um, and we're going to focus on reproduction because that's arguably the most important part when we look at the sustainability of a population. Oh, sorry about that. No, that's right. Um, so as I said, reproduction. The re reproductive um, system in, in sharks, you know, generally speaking, physiologically speaking, is similar to humans um, in the sense that estrogen, uh, progesterone, and testosterone modify reproductive behaviour and how pregnancy is carried out. Um, and we also found that the stress response um, during pregnancy is, or I, the stress response during pregnancy um, is similar. Um, there's, there's some studies that have shown that sharks and rays, you know, actually abort or drop their pups um, when, they're, when they're caught uh, in certain fisheries just because of the stress that's involved. Um, now, when this happens, it's one of two, it, it's a couple of things. It's mum protecting herself so that she can survive and that enables her to reproduce um, over the next few years that, that she's alive. Um, and the other thing is, is that, you know, maintaining that pregnancy could become risky given that she's experienced so much stress. So dropping pups could also mean that um, the animal, uh, the, the ray or the shark is giving their offspring the best chances possible, even though it might not be the greatest. So that does happen. 
Um, when I studied fiddler rays, as you can see in these pictures here, um, I looked at, again, how stress was affecting um, their pregnancy and their offspring. And I found that fiddler rays that were stressed, similar to humans when they experience a lot of stress during pregnancy, and that is there was smaller offspring, um, they weighed less, and also mum, after she'd given birth, she'd weighed less. Although I noticed it a bit too late in terms of recording the data, I remember looking, at, looking after these females over a period of months after I'd, I'd simulated trawling on them in the lab, and I noticed that they'd even eat a lot less than what their unstressed counterparts would. So there's a lot of implications here. Um, and with the blood samples, I, I looked at their immune response, their white blood cell counts. And the same thing happens to us humans too. It happens to you. And that is when you get sick, your white blood cells change in their proportions um, to fight off a disease or infection. But the catch to that is, is that it takes a lot of energy for your body to do that. So when we look at chronic stress, um, where this immune response is kind of consistently elevated, it's zapping a lot of your energy that would otherwise go to other things. So this could mean that there's less energy available for growth in these offspring. Um, it could mean that mum or the offspring become more vulnerable to disease because there's not enough energy available to fight off disease effectively. Um, so, and, and sorry, and generally in biology, generally speaking, um, smaller and lighter offspring um, than what they normally would be, typically are more vulnerable um, to, to being eaten by other animals or you know, a lower chance of survival. It's not a hard and fast rule, but it's, it's general rule. Um, so overall, it looks like it's a little bit more than just F. It's not just how many die. Um, and we really need to, to look more into what happens to them afterwards um, in terms of their reproduction as well. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, lost track there. So yeah, so as much as it might all seem doom and gloom, it's not. And as much as we are their greatest threat, we are also their single greatest hope. Um, over the decades of research, you know, fisheries, um, the way we manage our fisheries, the way we look after sharks, the measures we put in place to protect them have come a long way. Um, some of the solutions that have been implemented are things like changing hooks from J-hooks to O-hooks. And the reason for that being is that O-hooks um, prevent a shark essentially from swallowing the hook and literally cutting up its insides. Um, we no longer have wire traces, they're banned. So wire trace is that line that goes from the main line down to the hook. Um, so with a wire trace, a shark can't bite through that and swim freely off. Uh, whereas now that we don't have them, sharks are able to do that and they're not unnecessarily getting caught. We've also got area closures to protect habitats that are vulnerable, um, not necessarily where they're all required, but in some places. So in Southern Australia, there are depth closures. So certain spots, 700 metres or more, um, are closed to fishing to protect deep water dogfish. Uh, and there are devices we can put on our fishing gear. Uh, one's called a turtle excluder device. This is basically an escape hatch in a trawl net that allows turtles to escape, but also larger animals, not just sharks and rays, but even dolphins. So there are solutions. Um, the research needs to continue. Funding needs to continue. Um, conservation needs to continue so that we can ensure that we have better ways to fish for the future. And it's not just about protecting sharks. Sharks are incredibly important to marine ecosystems. And they keep the food webs in balance and a healthy ocean needs its sharks. So by looking after sharks through the way we fish, we're looking after the broader ocean. And in doing so, we're ensuring that our fishery is more sustainable and that we can enjoy the ocean for its bounties and its joys for as many years as we possibly can. So if you're asking yourself, how can you help specifically? There are a couple of ways. Um, first and foremost, <clears throat> it'd be awesome if you could join over 30,000 shark champions. That's the Australian Marine Conservation Society's uh, and Humane Science International's shark conservation campaign. Uh, you'll notice in the comments, there's a link um, to a petition to save the critically endangered skeleton hammerhead in the Great Barrier Reef. As I touched on earlier, um, there are industrial sized gill nets in the reef that are you know, up to 1.2 kilometres long, hanging in our Great Barrier Reef that, uh, that ensnare these wonderful sharks and they're in dire straits and they need every help they can get. So I highly recommend you sign that petition and join us to help save sharks across the country. You can also download Australian Marine Conservation Society's Good Fish Guide. Um, this enables you to source sustainable alternatives uh, for seafood. Next time you're out at a restaurant, head into the fish and chip shop, anywhere you like, um, have a look at your green listed species and perhaps have a look at some species you might not have sort of wanted to eat before, but would like to try. 
And lastly, um, you can always donate. So again, this is links in the comments. Um, every little bit helps. Even chipping in 10 bucks to kickstart um, our vital campaign work from 2021 and beyond goes a long way to improve um, the state of our sharks in this wonderful country. Um, so yeah, so thanks very much. Um, and now um, I'll address some questions. So just bear with me. I'll just bring up a, um, uh, where are we? Sorry, one moment. Hopefully I'll be able to get my list of questions up. All righty. Okay, questions. Julie Smith. Uh, Julie Smith asks, would you analyze for stress enzymes? Um, yes. So there's a lot of work uh, that has been done or is being done on looking at certain enzymes and certain proteins as to what we can use to, uh, to, you know, to build this comprehensive picture and find the holy grail of that one marker that says, is the shark going to live or die? Um, one I am aware of, although forgive my biochemistry here, if it's technically an enzyme or not, but uh, heat shock proteins. Um, so they've looked at heat shock proteins uh, in mako sharks, last I recall, a couple of years back. Um, and they're, yeah, they're, they're another potential um, indicator for stress. So, and I, I dare say there, is, there are some other elements that, that haven't been explored that, that might be quite useful as well. Uh, Julie's also asked, how do you assay for a base level of stress products? Um, I'm assuming that means, how do you establish a base level of stress? Um, that's a really important question. So base level of stress is kind of like, um, you know, at a resting stage. So for example, you and I sitting here, what's a baseline and anything above that, that indicates stress. Um, it's tricky for sharks because <clears throat> as I said, there's a lot of variation across species and even within species because we're not measuring a stress hormone per se. We're measuring a lot of varying different factors. Um, it really comes down to understanding certain species responses and using sort of rough thresholds and then applying those to, to other species. So what I mean by that is, is um, we did a lot of work on gummy sharks. Uh, the reason we did that is they're fairly abundant. They're small, you can put them in a tank. They're pretty hardy. They handle experiments really well. And from that gummy sharks, we look at, malt, we look at um, lactic acid, and glucose and potassium. And over years of research, we kind of get a clearer picture of what's as best a resting state as possible of these levels. And then manipulating experiments, <coughs> excuse me, through manipulating experiments of like how long they're captured for um, and then how long they're released for and how long they survive in the tanks afterwards, we can then track those responses to lactate, glucose and potassium over time. So it can be hours through to days up to a week. And then looking backwards in time, we go, okay, based on all the samples we've done, all the experiments we've done, this is roughly where the baseline is going to be. Um, and this is roughly where the peak is going to be. And does that peak correlate or match up with um, individuals that we saw that we um, noticed die um, and that's kind of how we do it so geez mate stay still geez so it the short answer is it's super tricky to get a baseline estimate because you're, you're measuring a lot of different things like lactic acid glucose potassium and so forth um, and it, it's only available for a few species and even still it's it's a it's an estimate um, it's a tricky thing to measure without actually having a definitive stress hormone per se. Um, Alison has asked, what percentage of shark young survive to adulthood? That's a super good question. Um, oof. I dare say probably not a lot. Um, again, it would depend on the species. So generally species that are going to give birth to quite a few pups. Um, so say, for example, gummy shark, as I mentioned earlier, 20 to 30 pups perhaps each year. They're more on the faster reproducting side of sharks. Um, that's a numbers game uh, because ultimately small sharks are easy pickings for other sharks. Um, I dare say the smaller sharks are one of the primary food sources for other sharks. So, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. I would say not many. Um, nature, she can be quite brutal. Um, and it, it goes to speaking to, you know, only the fittest surviving. Um, and it also speaks to, to, to species like the grey nurse shark that, you know, give birth to perhaps one, one shark a year, or one offspring a year. You know, if, if survival rates aren't the greatest, um, it really speaks to the additional impacts we're facing. 
But in saying that, you've got great white sharks. Um, their offspring are born from memory at about one and one and a half metres, um, and they're ready made. Um, they'll start hunting sort of small fish um, from the get go. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head their survival rate, but suffice to say that um, general rule of thumb is I suppose the more offspring you're going to give birth to in one hit, you're playing a bit of a numbers game. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, a numbers game in the sense that at least some will survive. If you're a species that's evolved to give birth to very few young, uh, like maybe one or two, then generally speaking, they've probably got a reasonably good chance of survival compared to say those other species that give birth for quite a lot. Andrew's asked, uh, do you know what happens to sharks released from shark nets and drum lines? Uh, yeah, a little bit. So similar to what the work I've done in the past and what a lot of scientists are doing is measuring the stress response as I've talked about with fishing. Um, it's not so much happening with nets. Um, nets are just terrible. Like they'll stop a shark in its tracks. And especially when you're looking at shark mitigation programs and the, how, the, I suppose, how often they check the nets, which probably isn't that often at all. Um, you can pretty much guarantee a shark's gonna be dead. Uh, but if we look at drum lines, um, smart drum lines specifically, where they have to go out and release the shark tag it, they'll often take blood samples, measures of stress. There's been studies uh, recently published, particularly on great white sharks. Um, and great white sharks are pretty tough. Um, you know, they can be out on the hook for a couple of hours, um, be released and in relatively good nick. Um, you know, and the tags show that. Um, should have mentioned earlier that satellite tags are often used on sharks so that when we measure their stress response and they do get released, uh, we can actually tell, okay, based on the blood profile and the fact that it's swimming for 10 days, perhaps that's not so bad. Whereas there have been satellite tags where they'll take a blood profile and the satellite tag has showed that the shark died two days later. You might then go back to the research and go, well, um, you know, these levels are considerably higher than the baseline, which goes back to that earlier question. So when you understand a baseline or a rough estimate, and again, it's very species specific, but we can get an understanding of survival. So yeah, so in short, nets, bad news, they're gonna die. Um, smart drum lines where there is an opportunity to go out to the net and look at the shark and take a sample. Again, it will depend on the species, white sharks, you know, pretty hardy. They'll probably survive if they're gotten to within a few hours, which is the idea. So when a smart, I should explain, when a smart drum line um, sends an alert to, fit, to fisheries managers on the, on the shore, they then hop in the boats, head out to the drum line, release the shark and tag it. Um, but again, if you're looking at a hammerhead that decides to take a bite on a smart drum line, um, yeah, good luck, unfortunately, good luck. Tiger sharks, on the other hand, um, pretty resilient too. I'd say in a similar boat to a guai shark. They'll, they'll survive if they've gotten to in time. Um, I don't know if there's any more questions. I can't see them on my screen. So apologies if I've missed any, but as I said, I'll, um, I'll have a look at the comments over the next few days and get to as many as I can. Um, if you've got any further comments, add them to the comments section. Uh, and if you'd like to get in touch with myself, uh, you can also email amcs at amcs.org.au. Drop my name. If you want to chat more about sharks, always happy to. So thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon and take care. See you.